Good morning. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked around the towns and villages of Judea, proclaiming with signs and wonders that the kingdom of God had come. It came in the very person who formed the stars and planets, who breathed life into a voidless space, and who, taking the very dust of the earth, made humankind. And now he himself took on that same humanity, becoming like us in every way, so that we might become like him. Such was and is the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Over the last few weeks, we have experienced the reality that church is not a building. Because despite its doors being closed, we are still here, still proclaiming the kingdom of God. Church is not about bricks and stained glass windows, as beautiful as they are. Church is about people who love Jesus, who put him at the very centre of their lives and in so doing want others to experience that same life and love. So as we prepare this Holy Week together to pray in different ways and from different traditions, let us pray also that we may hold on to this reality even when our buildings reopen and we gather together once again. That we may never lose sight of what church is all about people who love God because he first loved them. So let's begin again with our story from the convent chapel and we would take off where we left off the other day. Now I don't know how to put it. I have never put it into words before except to myself. But I became aware in my intellect alone of one or two clear facts. In order to tell you what those facts were, I must use picture language. But remember they are only translations or paraphrases of what I perceived. First I became aware that there ran a vital connection from the tabernacle to the woman. You may think of it as one of those bands that you see in machinery connecting two wheels, so that when either wheel moves, the other wheel moves too. Now in the tabernacle I became aware that there was a mighty stirring and movement. Something within it beat like a vast heart and the vibrations of each pulse seemed to quiver through all of the ground. Or you may picture it as the movement of a deer and deep pool when the basin that contains it is jarred and it seems like the movement of circular ripples crossing and recrossing in swift thrills. Or you may think of it as that faint movement of light and shade that may be seen in the heart of a white-hot furnace. Or again you may picture it as a sound, the sound of a high ship mast with the rigging in a steady wind, or the sound of deep woods in a July noon. The priest's face was working and his hands moved nervously. How hopeless it is, he said, to express all of this. Remember that all these pictures are not in the least what I perceived. They are only grotesque paraphrases of a spiritual fact that was shown to me. Now I was aware that there was something of the same activity in the heart of this woman, but I did not know what was the controlling power. I did not know whether the initiative sprang from the tabernacle and communicated itself to the nun's will, whether she, by bending herself upon the tabernacle, set in motion a huge power. It appears to me possible that the solution lay in the fact that two wills cooperated each reacting upon the other. This, in a kind of way, appears to me now true as regard the whole mystery of free will and prayer and grace. At any rate, the union of these two represented itself to me, as I have said, as forming a kind of engine that radiated an immense light or sound or movement. And then I perceived something else too. I once fell asleep in one of those fast trains from the north, and I didn't wake up until we had reached the terminal. The last thing that I had seen before falling asleep had been the quiet, darkening woods and fields through which we were sliding, 
and it was a shock then to wake in the bright humming terminal and to drive through the crowded streets under the electric glare from the lamps and the windows. Now I felt something of that sort now. A moment ago I had fancied myself apart from movement and activity in this quiet convent. But I seemed somehow to have stepped into a centre of busy, rushing life. I can scarcely put the sensation more clearly than that. I was aware that the atmosphere was charged with energy. Great power seemed to be astir, and I to be close to a whirling centre of it all. Or think of it like this. Have you ever had to wait in a city office? If you have done that, you will know how intensely quiet can coexist with intense activity. There are quiet figures here and there around the room. Or it may be there is only one such figure, a great financier, and he is sitting there almost motionless. Yet you also know that every movement tingles, as it were, out from that still room all over the world. You can picture to yourself how people leap to obey or to resist, how lives rise and fall and fortunes are made and lost at the gentle movements of this quiet, lonely man in his office. And so it was here. We will resume the final part of this story tomorrow. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving power among the nations. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up, that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross, and always be ready to share its weight, declaring your love for all the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Have mercy on me, O God, in your great goodness. According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my offences. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my faults, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and righteous in your judgment. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me again the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your gracious Spirit. Then shall I teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from my guilt, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. My friends, the night has passed, and the day lies open before us. So let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Today's psalm is Psalm 41. Blessed are those who consider the poor and needy. The Lord will deliver them in the time of trouble. The Lord preserves them and restores their life, that they may be happy in the land, he will not hand them over to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed. Their sickness, Lord, you will remove. And so I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal me, 
for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil about me, asking when I shall die and my name perish. If they come to see me, they utter empty words. Their heart gathers mischief. When they go out, they tell it all abroad. All my enemies whisper together against me. Against me they devise evil. They say that a deadly thing has laid hold of me, and that I will not rise again from where I lie. Even my bosom friend whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me, and raise me up that I may reward them. By this I know that you favour me, that my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity you uphold me, and you will set me before your face for ever. Blessed be the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and Amen. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Lamentations, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has no one to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her and they have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals, and all her gates are desolate. Her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters, and her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From door to Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was no one to help her, the foe looked on mocking over her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously, so she has become a mockery. All who honoured her now despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Her downfall was appalling with no one to comfort her. O Lord, look at my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Enemies have stretched out their hands over all her precious things. She has even seen the nations invade her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see how worthless I have become. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Our second reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Jesus, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and he conferred with the chief priests and the officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread 
on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table, and the apostles were with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after su supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who could do this. We say together the words of the Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And so with faith and love, and in union with Christ, let us offer our prayers before the throne of God's grace. Father, have mercy on your people for whom your Son, Jesus, laid down his life. Bring healing and wholeness to people and nations, and, Lord, have pity on those torn apart by division. Please strengthen all those who are persecuted for your name's sake, and deliver them from evil. Look in mercy upon all who suffer, and hear those who cry out in pain and desolation. Bring comfort to the dying, and gladden their hearts with the vision of your eternal glory. Give rest to the departed, and bring them with all of your saints to glory everlasting. We remember especially Margaret de Souza. In a moment of quietness, let us commend the world for which Christ Jesus died, to the mercy and to the protection of God.
almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility, and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And so standing at the foot of the cross, and as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. May Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen.